people become very orderly, compliant. Um, welcome to our first exhibition of 2023, and Happy New Year. I'm Maureen O'Neill, the director of the Barton Art Galleries. It's really nice to see you here. Um, we are so pleased to present this exhibition at ease, bridging the military-civilian divide. Um, this traveling multimedia exhibition is part of the work by the Creative Community-Based Action Team hidden voices. We are honored to have this traveling exhibit in our space and a special thanks to the artist William Paul Thomas for um, his help bringing it here to Barton College. Uh, of course, I can't start without introducing my interns for this semester. So if you would please come up, Liz Denton, Amy Mendoza. Oh, Amy didn't come. Oh, she's been called out. <laughs> uh, Alexis Lakey. Sarah Aldridge, and Dara Condosa. So each semester, um, the Barton Art Galleries has a team of students who um, come into this space and help me. Um, and they're just um, do all kinds of uh, behind the scenes work. And uh, with this, this, these events and, and these exhibitions, I wouldn't be able to do them without the help of the interns. Um, and I also have a couple who are minors in gallery museum um, management, and that would be Sarah and Alexis here in the middle. And Sarah is in her last semester, and I'm gonna miss her terribly, and so is Liz. So that's, I never like seeing them go. So thank you, you can sit now. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so tonight our, our guest speaker is, um, there's two. So the first is Lyndon Harris, and she is the founder of Hidden Voices, um, an inclusive, participatory, and co-creative collective committed to a more just and compassionate world. For 20 years, Harris has collaborated with underrepresented communities to create award-winning works, combining narrative performance, mapping, music, digital media, and interactive exhibits. A founding cultural agent for the U.S. Department of Arts and Culture, Harris is a Blade of Grass Fellow, a recipient of the Ann Atwater Theater Award, and the 2020 North Carolina Playwriting Fellow. She also is the editor of Right Here, Right Now, Life Stories from America's Death Row. Accompanying her tonight is William Paul Thomas. And William is someone that we love so much here at the Bar in, in our Barton community. And um, he first exhibited in this space in 2019 with his extraordinary show, Mood Swings. Um, and then he came back in the spring of 2021 um, when we were all masked up um, and bravely came and did a sort of a mini retrospective um, and also was our artist in residence and worked with our students for two, two weeks. And, and of course it was um, just, incredible and just impactful in, in so many ways. So uh, William is here as well. So please join me in um, celebrating Lyndon and William being here with us tonight. How's that? Good? Okay. We'll see if it works. 
Um, so yeah, we're really excited to be here tonight. I think the exhibit looks beautiful. And thank you, Maureen, for making that happen over break. Uh, so Hidden Voices at, at its essence is a story sharing organization. So I just wanna always start by saying a story is a gift. Stories offer us pathways to connection, to caring and to transformation. Um, you know, people forget statistics, right? We forget places, we forget names, we forget dates, but we remember stories because human beings think in narrative. Uh, stories are how we learn. Stories are how we make sense of the world. Stories are what we remember. So tonight we wanted to share some images of uh, kind of like the range of our story sharing work because it's really broad. And um, how we end up with an exhibit like this. So basically, uh, Hidden Voices creates collaborative community-based projects that engage audiences and the participants in the projects in explorations of complex stories. This is an image um, taken at the world premiere for our play Count, Stories from America's Death Row, which is part of the project Serving Life, Revisioning Justice. And this is an image at the National Museum of Art at Duke University of uh, none of the above dismantling, dismantling the school to prison pipeline. So we wanted to talk briefly about our vision and our values because they're really the heart of what we do and they direct every piece of every project. So first of all, all lives have meaning. This is a shot um, of community members who participated in La Vida Local, which was a project with undocumented young people back in 2004, I believe. Second, every story matters. Stories are really the easiest way for us to connect across difference. So at Hidden Voices, we use stories as pathways for audiences to experience the world differently. And I don't mean just to see the world differently, but to actually feel the world differently in an embodied way. This is a life map created by a man living on death row. And it's part of the exhibit from our project, Serving Life, Revisioning Justice. Our third value is that everyone, 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 so that's us up here, you out there, and everyone that's not here with us um, is our creative. Uh, it's in our DNA. And so a self, this is a self-portrait created by a participant uh, from the project Speaking Without Tongues um, with survivors of family violence. And the fourth value I wanted to mention is that sharing space is vital. It is just the simplest way to connect and to really become kind of deeply available to one another. So at Hidden Voices, we aren't looking at drawing lines of inclusion and exclusion. We are really looking to draw bigger and bigger circles. Uh, because when we listen without judgment, we really empower each other to tell the stories that matter most, um, to shed light on very complex situations, and to envision together the future we want to create. So for five years, I taught a course at Duke University called Stories for Social Change. And one of the students said the most important thing they felt like they learned during the course was they learned to, how to listen to understand rather than listen to respond. And these are self-portraits created by middle school participants in our overnight camp Seeking the Self. So this is how we describe ourselves. Hidden Voices is a radically inclusive, participatory, and co-creative collective. Uh, so that collective can easily involve hundreds of participants and, and artists, artists in each project. Uh, this is a photo uh, from Because We're Still Here and Moving, mapping the world of Black history in our own backyard. So this project <coughs> explores the complex relationship between UNC uh, Chapel Hill, the historically African-American neighborhoods that surround uh, Chapel Hill, and student housing access and gentrification. So radically inclusive uh, is one way that Will said that we talk about our work, meaning that not all, that all voices aren't just uh, welcome, but they're really necessary if we're going to be able to understand a larger picture of any issue. So we actively seek out those who might not initially feel included. This photo is from the 2004 project, Not Your Mama's Home Cooking, the changing face of rural North Carolina. Participatory. So we bring a process, not an agenda. Basically, we just bring a lot of questions, but no answers. 
So we don't have time to go into the details of the Hidden Voices process other than to say when a community invites us to come work with them, the first thing we do is help um, them identify a core circle of stakeholders. And so we work with that core circle of stakeholders through a whole bunch of those generative questions to kind of envision the outcomes, the outputs, and the outreach that's needed. These are public school teachers helping create the exhibit and performance materials for none of the above dismantling the school to prison pipeline. And finally, this is from one of the uh, workshops where we created the, uh, the, where participants created the boxes that you see in the back gallery. So we describe ourselves as co-creative and our approach as artists evolves with each participant's voice. So we're going to talk just a little bit now about how we work collaboratively with participants in the workshops. So for many years, we participated in an overnight summer camp that I mentioned called Seeking the Self. And we spent a week with 13 and 14-year-olds exploring race, ethnicity, gender, identity, and counter-narrative. We worked with students to take their portraits and have them pose the way they wanted to see themselves. It was always fun seeing some of the more reserved students open up and get excited about expressing their character on camera. Uh, the artworks were opportunities for them to celebrate who they are and to resist the negative stereotypes that might be placed on them based on some aspect of their identity. Uh, the name tags that you, they wore that you see on this person's uh, chest um, features a stereotype that they wanted to challenge while their poses and artistic expressions conveyed their counter narratives the things about their values and personalities that were important to them. Marco, uh, so like many diverse uh, community workshops, the beauty of these collaborations is that you have students that have already identified uh, a love for creating, working alongside students that don't feel as confident in their artistic skills, uh, but who now feel inspired or felt inspired by working together uh, and empowered to express themselves and share their stories in ways that they might not have typically been asked to. So this is a photo um, from the, that world premiere of Count, Stories from America's Death Row. Um, that project is a great example of how a project evolves over years uh, through collaboration and different participant voices. So the project began when a man living on death row read an article about hidden voices. This was like, I think, 2013. And he tore out the article and gave it to the program's uh, manager, the lead psychologist on death row, and said, you know, um, can, can you get these people in here? Well, the psychologist contacted me and he said, can you develop a project for these men? And I said, well, give us six months and we will actually come inside, bring our hidden voices process, and we'll develop a project with the guys. So we did that. And, you know, I mentioned the outcomes and outputs and outreach. Well, the men's top outcome that they wanted to see was we want people, we want to disrupt the stereotype of who lives on death row. We want people to know that we're not monsters. So for about a year, we went in um, and played like exceptionally silly children's games, like the dumbest games I could think of for us to play together, to start to build a kind of uh, feeling of a cohort with 12 of these guys. And, um, so after about a year, we shared stories, they wrote, we played games. And then I said, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to create a play and we're going to perform it here on here on death row. And the guys just like looked at me because many of them had never seen a play. Uh, none of them have ever seen a script. So they were just kind of like, what? <laughs> but what was really funny was like by week three of going in with the script and, and rehearsing, we came in the next week and they're like, we got it. We got this. And they had developed like their own blocking. They had come up with their own bits of business. You know, they were just way on down the road. And there was one of the sergeants who really got into it. And we would show up and she would say like, they all know their lines except so-and-so or, you know, oh, they all worked so hard this week. I'm really proud of them. So, uh, yeah, so that was really that was really quite fun. After about six months of rehearsal, the guys were able to perform Serving Life on Death Row for about, um, I don't know, 80 or 90 other prisoners, administration, mental health staff, and maybe most importantly, corrections officers. Um, and many of the men said these performances were the highlight of their lives. And then the following year, the staff was allowed to um, invite administration from other facilities, including juvenile justice, which was really extraordinary. It's a little hard to imagine, but that level of outreach for these guys on death row 
they, um, you know, obviously they had no connection to the internet. They had no phones. They had no contact visits. Their, their only access to the outside world was through letters. So having somebody, a person of authority sitting right in front of you like this, listening to you share your story was really um, quite extraordinary. Um, So one of the men's goals was to reach audiences with the power to affect change to their voice and their vote. And so we went on to create Count from their stories. Um, and it had its world premiere at Playmakers Repertory Company. And we had no idea if anybody would come because that title is very explicit. <laughs> and uh, it actually broke box office records at that still stand, which I think uh, sort of really tests is a testament to how audiences want to understand the lives that, that our society has chosen to obscure. So now we'll take a look at this image of the traveling interactive exhibit uh, for Serving Life, both the uh, art created on death row by, and by partnering artists in the Hidden Voices Collective. So uh, this photo here is uh, taken at Visual Art Exchange uh, downtown Raleigh. So we do some kind of mapping with almost every project. And for this project, we invited the um, men to create something we called life maps. I mean, we made it up, but each map had a compass rose to sort of orient the viewer and um, a legend with the symbols on it. And this map was called Lost and Found. And the map maker's name is inscribed in Arabic and gold across the map. And we're going to come back to this in just a minute. So this uh, life map on the, on the right uh, is called White Moves First. This was a death row chess master's map where the chess pieces are stand in for uh, actual people in his life. Um, the map on the left uh, is called the masked man. Um, so you can see the fear and pain in the box. So inside our mask representing the many terrifying faces of an abusive father. And we'll come back to that. So this Slide here on the left are newspaper articles and trial transcripts, transcripts collage into a life map with the map maker's response to the question, what frightened you as a child? His answer was my own anger. So if you look at the map retrograde on the right with the solar system and the astronauts lost in space, you'll see a photo of this map maker as a boy. Well, tiny photo there. Somewhere on each life map is a photo of the man as babies or little children. So then we invited 12 artists um, in the collective to partner with the 12 men who were making maps to highlight one of the elements in the maps. Um, and there was so there was a personal connection between the artist and the map maker. For instance, we had a native artist working with a, a native map maker and a Muslim artist with a Muslim map maker. And this dresser was based on that first map you saw called Lost and Found. Each drawer explores one of the map maker's experiences. His first story was about being left as an infant in a motel drawer. So you can see the artist here inscribed in that drawer, my first crib. So I happen to be paired with the uh, gentleman that made the piece, the life map with the mask. So you remember how I pointed out the fear and pain in the box, in that box? Um, this is my creation of sort of paper mache version that enlarged uh, what we saw Huge. in those small masks. And this is another shot from uh, VAE. So when you look into the eye sockets, um, what you saw were quotes from the map maker living on death row. And the exhibit closes with uh, letters and drawings from men around the country and an invitation for viewers to respond to the stories that they have seen and heard. We envision serving life as a call and response. Um, and so I'll, I'll Talk just a little bit more about that in a minute. Okay. This is an image from the Ruby, uh, the Rubicon Art Center at Duke University. And so you, you can see in this one, there are phones hanging on the wall that allows you to, to listen to some of the men uh, reading some of their stories. So with every project, uh, we create what we call a story cycle. And it's a curated collection of all of the, of the various stories that we've collected over the years. And they, they're designed to take listeners on a journey um, through the really diverse perspectives and experiences of different sort of stakeholders in that project. 
And the particular, the real beauty of the story cycle, and you'll get to see this in just a few minutes, is that they're really flexible. They can be performed by three or four actors for an audience of hundreds, or they can be read in a classroom, literally just passing it around one person after another. And um, we're going to get to hear in a few minutes some of the stories from the story cycle for At Ease. And this is a screenshot from our, our website of the Right Now, Right Now stories right here, right now, story cycle page. And you can go there and you can listen to performers read some of the stories as part of World Social Justice Day. And those stories went on to become the basis for Right Here, Right Now, published by Duke University Press. So I thought I'd tell you a quick story about one of the story cycle readings to sort of emphasize both the power of speaking someone else's words and also how a project evolves. Um, so we had just finished a, a reading, a performance, about, I think, four actors reading a uh, story cycle for Right Here, Right Now. And there were about 400 audience members there, students, community members, faculty. And at the end of it, they were just on their feet. Uh, they were applauding and stomping and whistling. And a lot, a lot of people were uh, crying. And what was beautiful about this is we had invited family members of men living on North Carolina's death row if they could come to North Carolina to come to dinner beforehand and come to the reading. Because a lot of people don't realize that somebody who's incarcerated in North Carolina, I mean, their family may be in California or Maine or I mean, they could be anywhere. And so people go years and years and years without seeing their family. So the families were really taken aback. They, they had never expected that anybody would care. Um, and they had also never, nobody had ever met another parent with a child sentenced to be executed. So one of the moms, and actually one of the guys said after that night, he said, you gave my mother back her life. So after it, one of the moms came up to me and I thought she was going to say something about just the experience of hearing the stories and all that. And no, she, she came up to me and she said, okay, what I want to know is when are you going to tell our story? And it was just one of those moments as an artist where the path, you know, it's laid out for you. So I said to her, I said, I, I, uh, I don't know when, but I promise you we will. And so at that moment, our newest piece, it's called A Good Boy, sharing stories from family members of uh, men living on death row. And it's a musical theater piece. And this is a portrait of a woman whose brother was executed. So also as a, a part of the story sharing from family members, we created an exhibit called Standing on Love with photographer Jenny Warburg that offers portraits and reflections from more than a dozen of these families. So this is an image from that exhibit over at Duke Chapel and is currently on display at the North Carolina School of Science and Math uh, in Durham. So now we'll go ahead and share some stories from the workshops where participants created the materials for this project at ease. So those are some military service members working on something we called treasure chests. We bought a whole bunch of cigar boxes and natural objects and all kinds of craft papers. And we invited the participants to create what we called a treasure chest based on their internal treasures. So we were looking at strengths and virtues and they were looking at what they wanted to use to symbolize those. So we start most workshops with story sharing, often with a simple question, what do others not understand about your experience? Um, in the workshop with veterans, we then move on to letter writing with the prompt, you have no idea. So this letter talks about what it's like to live with and love someone with post-traumatic stress disorder. And then after finishing the letter, we invited folks to create care packages, which you can see in the back. Here it was kind of a, the idea was it would be a diorama sharing something they cared about, either based on the conversations we had beforehand or based on their letter. Um, and this care package is addressed to combat female veterans from the one now visible. And this interior speaks visually about moving from depression to transformation. See, as you can see, this care package is from the outsiders no one knew, pre-DADT, and it's addressed to one of the family no longer hiding, except, accepted, relieved, post-DADT. 
So these soldiers talked about don't ask, don't tell as a minefield where some soldiers spied on other soldiers, a time filled with great trepidation and anxiety. These particular soldiers went years um, in that situation of uncertainty and uh, high stress, and they ended up becoming the very first same-sex couple to get married at the base chapel. And there are some really beautiful stories about what it's like to uh, one of the great virtues of the military being that you obey orders. And so he talked about what, you know, what it was like having his commanding officer who completely disagreed with this ruling, but came to him and, sa and said, does your partner like to dance? Well, get his ass out on the dance floor. So the portraits and reflections you see on the wall uh, were responding to the question, what part of your body do you associate with your military service? Uh, so this uh, particular woman's response had to do with a traumatic brain injury. So this uh, soldier talked, hmm, okay, wait a minute. We're a little out of order. Can you skip down to the layers? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. So uh, this was a really interesting image because we talked about what the, the prompt being, um, sort of what you associate with your, uh, what part of your body you associate with your service. And this uh, service member, it was really enlightening to see her take the opportunity to share her story in a way that went beyond that original prompt. Um, so she brought in her uh, traditional Laotian skirt and shared with us that she chose the Navy over the Army because of her attraction to the white uniform she remembers seeing sailors wear in a Thai soap opera she used to watch with her mom. Um, she went on to pursue a successful career in the Navy and really only wore the white uniform to take pictures one time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this... This woman talked about her feet. She wore a size two <laughs> combat boot, and it took four years to get a pair made. It took so long that by the time she got her boot, she had become a colonel. And um, there's a great story. Uh, her portrait is hanging in the back, this one. And there's a great story uh, she has about her experience landing in Iraq with the commanding officer, which is in the story cycle. I don't know if it's going to be read tonight, but it's a it's a really funny story. She's like four feet, eight inches. You can only imagine. <laughs> so another at ease participant uh, reflecting on her work in the military justice branch reminds us to consider the stories that connect generations. She talked about the disappointment in the fact that some of the toxic as aspects regarding the treatment of women in the military are the same today as they were 40 years ago. Um, these stories help us see how we can continue to grow as a society, uh, especially in the areas that we think we've evolved. So that was a common theme that came up when we, we shot the portraits of women in Greensboro and at a military uh, convention for women. And, uh, you know, it was really moving to hear that sort of perspective about how the women felt like they had worked really hard to try to make things better for those who were going to come after them and, and feeling like they had in some ways and in other ways they hadn't and that it was, you know, a really um, heartfelt disappointment to some of them. So we're going to hear, so we talked about like the different ways of story sharing. So here you have portraits, you have text from the conversations. There are the care packages in the back. There are letters hanging on the wall that um, participants wrote based on the prompt, you have no idea. And so now we're going to hear some stories from the story cycle read by some of the interns. <laughs> Thank you for your service. Take one. I don't know what to say when someone says, thank you for your service. I used to say, well, thanks for paying taxes, just to get a laugh, because that's how I got paid. But no, it's good when 
people say thank you. It's cool there's people out there who feel that way. It's actually lots better than I thought. When I found out I was on order here, everyone was like, oh no, you're going to hate it. It's so liberal, blah, blah, blah. But it was the exact opposite. I knew there were people here that don't agree with what we're doing, but most people I've come in contact with have been very supportive. They say, thank you for your service, even if they don't agree with what the military is doing. And that's the best you can ask for. They have their reasons, they aren't stupid, and they have an informed opinion. As long as they understand, I joined the military because it was a family thing, but I stayed because I wanted to have some sort of say in protecting this country. The people in Afghanistan and in Iraq don't want us there, and they are going to keep fighting because they want us gone. So my feeling is I would rather them waste their resources fighting us over there, where I'm trained to fight, rather than planning another 9-11 because it's a lot easier on them to fight us over there. When people don't necessarily agree with the military and what we're doing, but are still very supportive of soldiers, that's pretty cool. I definitely respect that. Pumped up, transitioning, take three. I can't tell anybody how to transition well or what makes you stop doing some of the things you do. I think certain things I'll probably do the rest of my life, like being able to walk into a place and know where every exit is, door is, how many tables are in the room, how many people, what do they look, look like, and how are they acting. I can do that in seconds. Even driving, I analyze everything, going through underpasses, What's on the side of the road? Is there trash? Is there a car? And I know it's not necessary, and I'm working to calm that down, but that is a work in process. It's extremely hard to take the adrenaline down because you're pumped up on adrenaline the whole time you're over there. Bringing it down is tough. When I first got back home, it was hard to deal with a lot of things. I'd probably drink every day. No, probably I did. That was my coping. I was just kind of trying to forget about everything but drinking doesn't actually make you forget about every, anything. So there's really no point to be drunk all the time. You can't actually do much when you're drunk and you, cannot, and you sure can't afford it. I would be the brokest person ever. But transitioning is hard, real hard. Some days I feel like it would be a lot easier just to go back instead of being here, but that's not really logical either. You can't do that for the rest of your life. I'd kill myself probably in the first couple of years. The adrenaline and the stress, that's tough. that stuff's deadly. Having a support system helps. Going to the vet center, because we are veterans, most of us, have always done everything on our own. So it's extremely hard to have somebody to support you. Very hard to believe and trust that. A different woman, boot camp take one. You have no idea how fast it changes you. When I went to basic training the first time in the cafeteria, we had to be at parade rest to stand in line. And there was someone I knew from high school and he said, hey, and called my name. I turned my head and smiled because I was just shocked. I will never forget that drill sergeant started shouting, you fucking bitch, you damn hoe. You gonna come in trying to fuck somebody already. He cussed me out in front of the whole cafeteria. Maybe that doesn't sound like much, but at 18, and there's probably about a thousand soldiers in the room, and my superior telling me I was a whore and a bitch and I wanted to fuck, like he was inviting them to do what they wanted to be. I never got over that. From that day forward, I was a different woman. About two weeks in, we noticed one morning that this girl was missing. We'd been getting intensive PT because she couldn't keep up. She kept saying, I can't do it, breaking down, crying, because she couldn't get it. She couldn't get her bed correct. She couldn't fold her clothes correctly. She couldn't get any of it right. And we found out she was missing because she tried to kill herself. How did we not see it? How did we miss it? But we had to act like it didn't matter. If you show emotion, then you're weak too. 
She survived. Another girl didn't later. But it was the first time I was that close to someone who broke. That whole veteran suicide thing, I remember how many people attempted. You can go to boot camp and your entire life has changed. I don't regret joining in any capacity. I don't regret it at all, even though a lot of crap happened. But I grew up fast, real fast. Don't ask. This is back during Don't Ask, Don't Tell. There was a soldier who was gay. Everybody knew that she was gay. Her girlfriend was. And because she did her job, nobody really cared. That might, they might have not liked it and maybe had a little discomfort, but no one said anything. I mean, it just wasn't a big deal. So I was surprised when they lifted Don't Ask, Don't Tell with how many people actually had a problem with it. Because I'm thinking, who cares? Don't ask, don't tell. I mean, good soldiers are good soldiers. It's just another form of discrimination, like color or religion. I'd rather have a platoon full of homosexuals that was good than a platoon full of straight dudes that was just okay. At the end of the day, we need soldiers that are good and going to lead by example, just being good people. The thing about don't ask, don't tell is there were people who maybe wouldn't ask, but they'd stake out the parking lots at the local bars, the gay bars, to see who came out and check out their license plates. So DADT really didn't work. There was a lot of pushback to the repeal, of course, but I think that was mainly officers. Generals were saying to the soldiers, soldiers will be killed, that they would affect their combat readiness, or that it would adversely affect the morale. But the great thing about the military is we follow orders. The first military ball after the repeal, there was this general who had been opposed to ending DADT. A gay officer was there in his dress uniform and partner was there in a tux. Partner was kind of hanging out in the background and the general said to the officer, does your friend like to dance? When the officer said yes, the general said, then get his ass out on the dance floor. So basically it didn't matter what the general thought privately, he was going to follow orders. Thank you for your service, take three. I hear a lot from veterans how much they hate being thanked for their service, except the Vietnam vets. But the majority of veterans I know, the younger ones, don't like it. They just, it doesn't mean anything. That attitude has almost become a cliche now, but I don't mind being thanked. It's a way for a disconnected populace to feel more connected, and hey, whatever makes you sleep at night. We all do dumb shit every day and say stupid shit to people. I mean, we thank our bus drivers, and we thank our veterans because we want to feel good and we want to feel connected. I just say, it's an honor to serve, and that's as unconsidered a response as the thank you might have been, and it's all fine. The same way people say, how are you, when they're not really looking for an answer. They're just reaching out. I understand why veterans have this thing now. Don't thank me for my service. You don't know what I've done. But I'm like, dude, we're all just trying to connect with each other. If that's how you got to do it, that's how you got to do it. What's the problem? It's just words. Give people a chance. Conversation. Take one. A lot of it is just having the conversation. It's almost like people are scared to talk to us. Like they think everybody in the military has PTSD or something. But if you just ask, hey, 
do you mind talking to me about the military for a few minutes? I think most veterans would do that. I'll talk to anybody. I'm an open book. I recognize there's lots of people that don't like the military, and I'm good with that. That's one of your inherent rights as a citizen. If you don't like the military and you want to speak out against war, then by all means, go ahead. Voice that opinion. Just give some thought behind it. Do some research. Watch Fox News, CNN, Al Jazeera. Watch them all. Because it's easy to end up saying something that isn't necessarily true. If you come to a belief because of fake facts or whatever. For a lot of civilians, the military is what those people do or did. Those people that weren't smart enough to do something else. There's no sense of having a connection or value for military service. So the disconnect is real. But the American military is under civilian control. The American military goes nowhere that a civilian hasn't sent it. So like it or not, you have a responsibility here. Mostly, I would say, just give people a chance. Talk to people, listen, converse. Most veterans are pretty open with their experiences, and it's a conversation this country needs to have. Thanks. So I thought, you know, we, this is when we open it up to questions, reflections, um, comments, whatever you would like. And thank you to the readers. It was great to hear those voices. Yeah. I just want to say thank you all for doing this. You all read so well. The stories were just amazing. And I, I love what you're doing. Thank you for your service. <laughs> Thanks. I, mean, I appreciate no, that. No, for real. This is amazing. Thank you. Yeah. The things you don't think about. Yeah. You know, that it's really important things. I say thank you to people all the time for their service because I'm glad they're doing it and I'm not and I'm grateful. But it gives you a new perspective. Yeah. You know, just hearing these stories like I was saying earlier, one of the interesting things I think about this, this particular story cycle, as you heard, we've kind of got, thank you for your service, take one, take two, take three. So you get like different perspectives because I think there can be such a tendency to think of um, military service members in this kind of homogenous notion that they all think the same. They are, and it's not true. So, um, so yeah. Thanks. Yes. You mentioned about... <clears throat> the mother of a death row inmate asking when are you going to tell our story. I'm just curious, what about the children of those who are death row inmates, who grew up probably never having seen their father or mother, but only to be told that yeah. they are in death row. So that project, uh, that piece called A Good Boy, actually shares stories from children, grandparents, siblings, mothers, um, and, and, you know, uh, so people close. Because it is easy to forget with all of the projects, like, who all is affected? It's not just that face, but it's, you know, it's not just that face of that woman in the military, the chaplain. It's her husband. It's her, you know, for all of them, it's my, a much bigger circle of people who are involved and incarceration, certainly the ripples from incarceration in our country. I think everybody knows that we incarcerate more people than any other country in the world. And so um, there are, I believe, 10 million children with parents who are just as involved. So that is a, a, that's a lot, of, a lot of kids. I wanted to ask in connection with the camps that you talked about in which you had middle school age children come. Uh, I could see a number of those pictures are immigrant families. I am an immigrant. I moved to this country. So I'm just curious as you work with these different groups of people 
incarcerated immigrants, veterans, each with their special experiences that they bring about. Is there something that for you who has been involved in this project that you find as a common thread? Humanity is a common thread. But is there something else that you would say is a common thread that plays through all these different groups that you have with? I have a couple of things. What about you? I would say one thing that stands out to me is that being asked about your story in these contexts um, is actually seems to be really exciting for people in, in most of those groups. Like it's being asked about you, it seems like something that people aren't doing on a regular basis. Like maybe you're someone that confides in others about what you're going through, but I feel like I'll, I'll see people like sort of like really liven up and lighten up when it's time to share, like, like they're ready to share both like uh, the kids, the students, and the uh, veterans, um, everybody that I've had a chance to work with seem to be really excited about that, and I guess that's not really something that I expected. I think in a, in a different context, like I, I'm a instructor, a visual arts instructor at Guilford College, and I'm, I try, I sometimes lean, lean on what we do at Hidden Voices to try to figure out how to get students to engage more, but they seem to be really like, sort of like, they keep their stories close to them. But I see with Lyndon and some of the other folks we collaborate, like the way that they're able to get people to like really have a good time and look forward to sharing. So I, I feel like that common thread is like many of us really want to talk about what we've been through and we just need a, a comfortable, safe space to be able to do that. But that's something that stands out to me. That's a sort of a thread of the ones that I've been participating in. Yeah, I, th I just think that's really true when you ask people, what do others not understand about your life experience, about your people? Pretty much always have something important to share. Um, and so I, I, think that, I think that's exactly it. Because sometimes people feel like, oh, how do you get people to talk with you? But it's people are generally you're saying I've never been asked you know it's not it's not that they don't have anything to say it's just that platform that access hasn't really been brought brought to them and also I I think across the board people are motivated by helping someone else and if they feel like their story will make something easier for something else they are just very willing to share it. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I was just curious about the genesis of the organization, because I kind of talked about the um, uh, different pillars of your values at the organization, but I mean, it's just it's so diverse in the things that you've been involved in, and I was just curious about like how this yeah. Me too. Okay. <laughs> How did this all come How did this all happen? We yeah. don't know. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, Tell us your story. <laughs> yeah. So I was the artistic director at a theater. And in the late 90s, and um, there was this uh, movement toward diversifying audiences, uh, which is fantastic. But what that looked like practically was a kind of, a kind of outreach to see if, like, okay, we're going to do a black play in February. And we're going to see if we can get black communities to come. And we're going to do a women's play in March. And, you know, or a play that focuses on women characters, you know, like, good luck with that. And, you know, we're going to bring a bunch of women in. And so I was just thinking there's got to be a better way to, to do that. And so that was kind of one of the ways it started was I thought, I wonder what would happen. Not if we asked people what stories they wanted to hear, but what stories they had to tell. So that was the, we worked at uh, the very beginning in uh, at Raleigh Correctional Women's Prison. And then, so we, uh, and then communities, I mean, it just, it, so initially it was a, a season theme at a theater. And then it just, there were so many communities asking if we would come work with them that it just, I ended up leaving that job and starting an organization. I, I managed to create, I like to say, a, a niche I took two completely unfunded <laughs> things, arts and social justice, and put them together. <laughs> so it's like, oh, that was 
just not clever, but anyway, <laughs> but it's been fantastic. You know, funding is a constant struggle, but it's been great. Yeah. Um, one thing I noticed walking through is um, the revenue piece of the spend that you guys have been doing with um, Mr. Bernie and Mr. Bernie have been doing with Mr. Bernie and Mr. Bernie have been doing with Mr. Bernie and Mr. Bernie have been doing with Mr. Bernie and Mr. Bernie have been doing with giving them both this place to be seen and the voices to be heard. That's so special and that's so powerful. All of those individual pictures and moments and perspectives. Oh, thank you for saying that. I mean, you know, that we talk about one of our values being everyone is creative. I mean, look, this all came from the same question. <laughs> like, people just really, the question... You know, what part of your body do you most associate with your military service? And boom, right. people really just were so utterly. Like they were just like waiting on the chance to, for somebody yeah. to ask them. I think that's the, so you talked about us having like shot these uh, images at two different sites and share those stories. So the second time around, I, I don't know if the first group of women knew that we were going to be there. Were, those, were they responding kind of impromptu? I think so, yeah. yeah. But the second group, um, were invited to participate in, in Greensboro, and so it seemed like once they got the prompt, I think those are the ones where you see people having brought in items to share. But it's I get the impression that they were like really waiting to um, to have the opportunity yeah. to bring stuff in and show like this is a part of me, this is a part of my experience. Yeah, yeah. You see the woman. Where is it with her? Oh, in the back with their hair and the braid. She would, you know, she heard the question. She's like, oh, 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 I know, I know, it's my hair. Hang on a minute, you know, and then she kind of fancied it up some because she wanted to talk about what what hairstyle she was able to have and how that worked for her in the, in the military. So, uh, yeah, so it's just always great fun to see that creative, uh, that moment where you, someone says, oh, I know, I absolutely know, yeah. Thank you so much. Cool. Thank you, Alexander.